This is Women's Tech Radio, a show on the Jupiter Broadcasting Network interviewing interesting women in technology, exploring their roles and how they're successful in technology careers. I'm Paige. And I'm Angela. So Angela, today we are going to talk to Holly Gibson. She is a programmer for Black Locus. Yes, it was awesome, which apparently has a reference to Black Hole, which is badass. Mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, she is working kind of on data science and she went through boot camp and she does all sorts of cool things and we talk about um, all of them. Yes, it's a very good interview that we are going to get into as soon as I mention that you can support this show if you're listening week after week and you like the content and you would like to help in some way, you can go to patreon.com forward slash today. It is how uh, the whole network of Jupiter Broadcasting is funded, but specifically when you subscribe, you are helping out Women's Tech Radio as well. Patreon.com forward slash today. And we get started with today's interview by asking Holly what she's up to in tech today. software engineer at Black Locus. It's a subsidiary of Home Depot and they do data science for Home Depot. They do a lot of web scraping and track all of uh, Home Depot's product catalog and their competitors' prices so that they can price their products uh, accurately. So lots of big data. That's really cool because in a previous episode we were discussing um, that, was it Sears that needed a, a total IT aspect to it? And yeah. So okay. now, and this is similar. Um, black Locus, you said. Yes. Yeah. For Home Depot. Uh, locus means place. They're kind of like the black hole of the internet. They're sucking in everything. Wow. I like that. That That's is really a, cool. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. We were so we were essentially touching on the idea that um, at this point, all companies are becoming tech companies. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Home Depot acquired them three years ago. Um, they had become a client and immediately started negotiating to buy them because. Their tool was so awesome. Awesome. So you so you do data science, um, which I think of as kind of like a magical unicorn at this point, because no <laughs> one is quite willing to nail down what what that means in the tech sphere. So can you enlighten me? Sure. I'm more on the software engineer side, so I'm not writing the fancy algorithms that the data science people are. Um, we're working in Python and Java and JavaScript to consume the data and you know, wrap it and make it beautiful so that uh, average person can look at it and understand what it means. Okay, so so you write tools in Python and, and JavaScript and stuff so that, and then you take what they've done and make it so that someone like me can can get their head around it? Yes. Awesome. Very cool. What's your favorite piece of that stack? I really like all of it. So I'm a, I'm a generalist engineer. I'm you know, full stack, as they say, but generalist, I, I dabble in a little bit of everything. Um, I came out of a boot camp two years ago, and my first job was working at an education startup, doing everything from supporting the IT for the office to managing the server and the databases, doing the front end and the back end. So I really like all of it. Mainly, I like solving problems. So just let me solve problems. Let me use logic in my brain, and I'm happy. So boot camp is that the way that you got into the technology field? Sort of. It was a reboot. I studied uh, JavaScript and databases in college, and I took over the college website, and I managed it for five years. And I really enjoyed it, but I was a, a one-woman team and solo. So it was very lonely. I didn't have any mentors at that time. You know, web applications were just coming out, and it was before Facebook, so that's how old I am. Um, so, you know, people were just figuring stuff out, and, and so I, I didn't know how much I knew. I thought, I'm just a beginner. I don't know very much. You know, I've done this for five years. This is fun, but now I'm going to go try a bunch of other stuff. So I sold antiques on eBay, I managed a restaurant, I did summer camps for kids with disabilities. And then um, two years ago, I found out about a boot camp here in Austin, Texas, where I live. And uh, my husband and I signed up to do it together. It was a three-month program over the summer. Uh, hardest thing I've ever done, but got through it and really enjoyed having uh, teachers I could ask questions from, uh, classmates alongside of me, we were learning together building actual, you know, applications and projects. And it was really, really great experience. 
What do you think was the major difference between studying at a university level and being in the boot camp? Um, maybe was it the timeliness of it where the internet has grown so much and we have so much more to work with and so many more resources or more like the way that the instruction was done? What was the real standout to you that made it stick this time around and, and didn't last time? The way the instruction was done, I think sometimes universities are behind the ball. So the technology I was learning in school was already a couple years old. I went to a very small school and the classes were really little. Most of them I was by myself. So the professor would hand me a textbook and say, go read this, which was great. I was learning, but having the hands-on experience of the boot camp really resonated with me. I'm a mechanical person. I like building. I like, you know, learning by projects. So it just, it cemented the, the theory much more in my brain when I was actually doing stuff. That makes total sense. Um, and so you mentioned you mentioned in you talking about your university that that it was really confusing to tell like what the next steps were and um, and understanding how much you knew. Do you think that was? And then you mentioned a lack of mentors. Do you think those two are kind of related? And how have you tackled that this time around? Sure. Yeah. Um, so the program that I studied in school wasn't a traditional computer science program. It was a degree in theology, and they just added web design because they thought, well, people might want websites. So I took all the classes because I actually thought theology was boring. Um, so I loved the web design, and I, I wanted a job afterwards, and I didn't want to be a minister. So the web design seemed like a good route to go, but then I, you know, after I had built some sites and while I was thinking about leaving the university, I wasn't sure how to go about that because I didn't have a computer science degree on my resume. I didn't know anybody in computer science. All I knew is I liked web design and I built some stuff, but I wasn't sure how to translate that into getting a different job. And so I kind of just gave up and went and did other stuff where I knew I could sell myself in uh, marketing and graphic design and stuff. Uh, since going through the boot camp, it was great because they had relationships with local companies. They recommended we go to meetups, that we look for mentors, that we meet people in the local tech scene. And so immediately in the boot camp, like we started as a class going to different meetups, going to the JavaScript meetup, going to the Rails meetup. And then um, I was really lucky to go to a Women Who Code meetup that had uh, just started here in Austin at our boot camp, they had the first night there and I went and it was an informational meeting and I said, how can I help? And um, the woman said, how would you like to run Austin Women Who Code? <laughs> so the same I thing happened it, to me. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Not kidding. <laughs> so I took it over and um, now two, two years later, we, we have 1,200 members. And it's been awesome. Um, so that's really been a great avenue for me to meet other women in tech, to find mentors. Um, but what I tell like the women in my group is go to the meetups. If you see someone talking intelligently about something, you know, and you want to know more, go ask them questions. They could turn into a mentor. Um, like I mentioned, my first job was at an education startup by myself. So again, it's like one woman team. And I knew I needed help. And I knew where to go. So I went to the meetups. I met some people. And I was like, can you help me explain this code? I'm not understanding this. You know, I'm all by myself. And I said, yeah, let's meet for coffee. And I said, I'll buy you coffee. I'll buy you tacos, whatever you want. <laughs> uh, so one guy, we started meeting weekly for about four months. And he explained code to me and design patterns and different things. And really got me over the first hump in my job. And since then, I've been kind of networking through his friends and going, so do you know someone who knows this and someone who knows that? And, you know, just finding where the holes are in my knowledge and who can help me with those. There's lots of online classes and blogs and videos, and those are great. I learned mostly sitting with someone and pair programming. And so I'll read books and I will look at blogs. My, my best source of learning is from an actual physical person. So I really do like meeting. I, I Right now I'm learning Haskell and functional programming. So I meet weekly with my mentor who came through my first mentor. And it's great because he has a master's in computer science and he's been doing this for 15 years. 
and I can ask so many questions and I have just like, you know, a wealth of knowledge, you know, in that brain. So did you, did you find it with these mentors? Um, were they resistant to like the idea of being an official mentor or were they welcoming? How did you get over the fear of like asking them for that relationship? Or do they know that they're yeah, your also mentor? That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a funny question. Yeah. A lot of them don't like the label mentor, but they're, they're getting used to it. Um, most of them have been fascinated to teach a woman how to program because some of them haven't worked as often with a woman in programming and, and I'm fine with being um, a social experiment for them. <laughs> so you're, their, you're their token female programmer yeah. friend. Yep. And, and I'm fine. If they want to explain things and teach me, that's fine. I, I just make sure that it's someone I connect with, you know, on a personality level. I'm not going to work with someone who's going to speak down to me, you know, or be a programmer. Um, and the guys I've worked with have been very nice and very supportive and want to start a mentorship program for women who code so that they can get more women into tech. And um, so first of all, I didn't say, will you be my mentor? I just say, uh, you know, will you explain some code to me? And then if, if they're willing to meet, then I'll ask, you know, do you ever mentor people? And if they're like, no, I'm, I don't. And I'm not sure what that means. I'll say, well, you know, I'm learning this. Would you mind explaining stuff with me? Could you work with me on a weekly or a bi-week, bi-monthly basis, you know, what would fit in your schedule? So far, the people I've met have said, oh yeah, I can meet with you weekly and, you know, I'll buy them coffee. You know, I make sure that I'm thanking them in some way. And they, they've they all been really casual and, and nice about it. Um, and I do the same. You know, I'm, I meet with women from my Women Who Code group, we have a Sunday morning ladies coding brunch. And we code every Sunday morning. And I explain things to them, you know, that my mentors are teaching me. And so I think it's important that people keep giving and raising up the people below them. Yeah, that was totally going to be my question for you. And you answered it. Like, do you mentor as well? Mm -hmm. Very awesome that you do. I love that it's a brunch. That's a yeah, perfect. Really just perfect. Very cool. So so you go from like mentor first dating, like, can you explain this thing to me? And then if it goes well, you ask for more. Yes. So you you filled out our awesome guest form and you mentioned this and I just have to ask about it, that you rebuilt a server from a remote cabin in Finland. Yeah. So uh, last summer, our, our server was hacked while I was on a two-week vacation in Finland. My mother-in-law is Finnish, and she has a, a cabin uh, on a lake. A lot of people do there. They have saunas and cabins and stuff. And so we were on, I was on the train with my husband, and they have Wi-Fi. Finland is, you know, a great tech company, uh, country. You know, that's where Linux came from and Angry Birds and everything. So there's <laughs> Wi-Fi in the train, and I was checking my email and I, I saw that our server had been quarantined. And um, over the next week, I got to rebuild our server. I got a hotspot from the only electronic store in the village and had about three hours of sleep a night for a week. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's crazy. I, I, I do love that, though, about the modern world. It's like you can be anywhere and do what we yeah. do. I was FaceTiming with my boss. There was an eight hour difference and it would be three in the morning for her, but I was awake and telling her, you know, what I'd fix, where the progress was. Um, ended up happening is our app had been built by a, a back end team in Siberia and they had uh, forgot to put a firewall on our elastic search uh, search engine. It has an open facing port. And it didn't have a firewall, and a robot got installed and was DDoSing other servers. Oh man, that's that's not fun. No, but I got it fixed, and that actually that experience really made me feel like I can do this because up to that point, I'd been at that job straight out of the boot camp uh, nine months, and it was nine months of being terrified. Do I know what I'm doing? I'm all by myself. You know, even with my mentor, it's, you know, 
you have fear and sometimes the imposter syndrome and you can make things bigger than they really are in your head because you're not sure what's going to happen. You know, this is a whole new experience. You don't know what's coming down the road. And the unknown is more scary than the known. Well, the worst thing that can happen to you is having your server hacked. <laughs> so once I got that, I was like, I can do anything. You know, I'm not worried anymore. I, I, can, I can solve anything. Totally. I, so I can't imagine that you went through that, that much ops during boot camp is like, at least with the boot camps I've been exposed to and know about, like they don't do a ton of server stuff. Like how did you, how did you dive into that? I did, was that something you brought from before or would, did, were you just kind of teaching yourself on the fly to fix this thing? Uh, everything I learned on the job, uh, we use Linode. So they did have some documentation. Um, I knew the services that we used. So I, I knew how to install them and set them up. Um, thankfully, we used New Relic as a monitoring tool so I could see what processes were running and see that Elastic Search had a crazy amount, you know, of, of data being processed because it was, you know, DDoSing other stuff. So having the right tools, I think, is also really important. And thankfully, you know, the, the team in Siberia, even though they forgot the firewall, did set up New Relic. And... Um, we have now that company I had, after I came back, we switched over to Heroku. So we didn't have to worry about security anymore, but I still kept New Relic because I said, I need to be able to see, you know, the different processes. I need to know the health of our application and what's going on. And, um, yeah, I Googled a lot. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and Leno did have a, a brief document on, you know, how to deal with a quarantine server and, you know, what tools to install to scan your files and make sure they weren't corrupted. Um, but mainly it was just me solving this big riddle of what happened, what's going on and how do I fix it? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that's you. That's how I do things. It's just you kind of dive in and start Googling. Mm-hmm. Google knows. How did you get to the point where you could kind of know what to Google. I've, I've had that question from a lot of uh, ladies as I start to mentor them or they come into Women Who Code and they're like, well, I don't even know what to ask. Um, was was a lot of that, you know, wh- where did that happen for you or did that happen for you? Sure. That was one thing that I really appreciated from the boot camp. They worked with us on how do you Google. Um, in the beginning, the teachers would say, oh, well, just Google it. And I said, I don't know what to Google. What, you know, what terms, like if I'm trying to solve this, how do I Google? Like, what's the tech speak? And so having them work with us a few times, then you, you started to get comfortable with, you know, realizing, okay, these are the terms I need to search. And, you know, is this bringing a result on, on Stack Overflow? Then I'm probably searching the right thing. You know, if I'm getting results for tech forums, then, you know, you just you you keep doing it, and and if it if it's not returning the right thing, then switching out some terms and just trial and error mm-hmm. um, really helped. And and time, you know, as you do it more often and often, then you're going to start to know what what are the key terms to search, and it'll get easier. It is definitely a practice skill, I, I would say personally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I wanted to ask about your eBay selling, and you mentioned already a little bit that you were selling antiques. Mm -hmm. So how did you even like get in? Did you get into eBay when it was like super? I think it was like what ninety nine or two thousand that it really like yeah right about became popular. When when did you get into it, and and why? Two thousand and nine is when I got into it because my mother in law is a power seller. Um, Her whole job is selling on eBay, and. She has been doing it since 96. So when I was, when after I left the university and, and I was looking at other things to do, uh, she said, well, I can teach you a skill that you can use all the time, no matter what job you're at. And so she showed me how to set up, you know, a store. And uh, so again, mentoring is so important. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> and she showed me, you know, um, 
how to take good pictures. She bought me a light box so that I could, you know, place the items in the light box and, and take quality photos and a scale so I could, you know, say how heavy the things were for jewelry. You know, the different things that people want to know in the description, you know, of antique stuff. Um, so having her as a resource was really great. And then also where to find the stuff. Uh, we went to a lot of estate sales and since my mother and I had been doing this for about 14 years, she knew, you know, what kind of brands to look for and how to find good deals. And we would buy box lots and, you know, sift through the stuff. And, and she knew what could be sold by itself, what could be sold as an assortment. So, um, Having her as a mentor was great, and it was fun. I never made enough money at it because it's something you have to really work at full time to mm -hmm. build up enough inventory. Yeah, uh, but my mother-in-law does it, and she makes a good income and loves it. Right. I um. I actually just went to a garage sale recently, and it's uh, it's people that I actually know, and they buy storage units that are unpaid. Mm -hmm. And it's just luck of the draw. Everybody bids on it. Whoever is the highest gets it. And then they have a garage sale. And it's it's a really interesting model. A lot of work. Yeah. A lot of footwork. But a lot of footwork. So if you like that stuff, great. I <laughs> I was like, man, I don't want to do this. This is taking me hours to make a few dollars. Right. Right. <laughs> so I want to go work in an industry where I can make a nice amount of money mm -hmm. for just an hour of work. <laughs> yeah. If you're passionate about finding really unique antiques or something, like I could see it being a fun thing to do on the side. But yeah, definitely not. Definitely fun on the side. A primary I, thing. <laughs> got, I got my furniture through an estate sale. And so, you know, it's it's nice to have that resource. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how like the skills we accumulate over a life at time and how they affect everything. Yes. Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah, I actually came back to be a benefit because I I uh, judged at a PayPal eBay, eBay hackathon here in Austin, and I got to say, yeah, I'm, I'm an eBay seller. Yeah, there you go. It always interesting. So one last question before we go. Um, I wanted to know, since you mentioned it kind of before, like what tools do you use on a daily basis to, to do the work that you're doing now? You said you're in Python and JavaScript, but like, um, like what's on your laptop kind of thing? Sure. Uh, the text editor I use is Sublime Text. I really like it. I have installed a bunch of different packages that help me um, work with the code. Uh, I I use Mac, MacBook. So I use iTerm as my terminal. Um, I'm running in a virtual environment for Python using virtual EMBS. And let's see, for Front-end testing, we like to use Gulp and Karma. Uh, we are using Elasticsearch and Redis for our search engine. Um, the whole team is on HipChat and then Slack if HipChat breaks. <laughs> nice to have an alternative. So, yes, and uh, we have a lot of fun making our own little GIFs to uh, <laughs> have emoticons. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I would say those are the main tools that I'm using. Uh, we use AWS for our servers, and our our fancy ops guys do all of our builds as Debian packages. So um, builds have to be done on a on a Linux machine, but uh, most of the team is on MacBooks. Thank you for listening to this episode of Women's Tech Radio. Remember, you can find the full transcript of the show over at jupiterbroadcasting.com in the show notes. You can also catch us on Twitter at HeyWTR or email us WTR at jupiterbroadcasting.com. You can also find us and subscribe on any podcasting network of your choice, including iTunes or check us out on YouTube if you are not a podcast person or have a friend who's not a podcast person. Please feel free to recommend us. Um, you can also email us directly if you have comments, feedbacks, or people you'd like to hear on the show. We'd love to hear about it. Our email is wtr at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>